Welcome to this edition of Rattling the Bars. I'm Massa Musa. And I'm Maximilian Alvarez, editor-in-chief here at The Real News. First and foremost, Mansa and I and the whole Real News crew want to wish all of you watching and listening a happy May Day or International Workers' Day. This episode, of course, is a special crossover edition of Rattling the Bars that we are releasing on May 1st. And we are here to talk about the spirit and the meaning of May Day. Um, we're obviously not going to be able to give y'all a full, you know, rundown of the history of May Day, um, but we will talk a little bit about that history. And more importantly, we're going to talk about from our respective areas of expertise, i.e., uh, the fight against labor exploitation. Uh, in the fight for worker justice and dignity, and the fight against the prison industrial complex. Because we think that, especially on today, it's important to remember that you know May Day really embodies the spirit of the struggle against these twin forces. And it shows that the fight for uh, worker liberation and the fight to uh, liberate ourselves from the body swallowing society, destroying monster of the prison industrial complex are fundamentally intertwined. And so we wanna have an open and frank discussion uh, between me and Mansa about why it's so important for us uh, today of all days, but throughout the year to remember that these fights are necessarily connected. And before we get rolling, just in case, you know, folks um, don't know much about the history of this sacred holiday, you know, it is, as I said before, called International Workers Day. It is a holiday that is recognized and celebrated around the world. Uh, there's actually quite a fascinating history about why we in North America don't really celebrate May Day like we once did. Uh, we can't go into all of that, but if y'all are interested, you should go check out a great podcast that we released uh, at The Real News last year on May Day um, that details sort of the history of, of how and why the United States and Canada made a very conscious decision to move the labor holiday mm -hmm. in the country from the more radical May Day, May 1st, to Labor Day in September. Um, but we can't go into that now, but rest assured, you know, it wasn't to, you know, like embrace and yeah, celebrate right. the revolutionary yeah, like right. spirit of this holiday. It was in fact uh, to do the opposite. Um, but of course, May Day uh, it was really, the modern May Day, you know, was really um, founded in the 19th century here in the United States. Um, av after what has become known as the Haymarket Affair. And I'm going to just read to y'all a bit of a um, passage from a great article that was written in 2019 uh, by the brilliant author Rachel Ann Jolie for uh, the magazine In These Times. Shout out to our comrades over at In These Times magazine. So this article was called Why May Day Continues to Capture the Hearts and Imaginations of Workers. And Rachel writes in this article, quote, May Day was born in Chicago in 1886. During the late 19th century, workers, tired of 10 to 16 hour days and little pay, began to organize along socialist and anarchist principles. Whether in formal unions, political parties, or cultural groups, Working class people in the United States were motivated by their dismal conditions and the hope they found in anti-capitalist ideas. With discussion about unfair working conditions spreading like a fever, the 1884 Convention of the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions, or the FOTLU, concluded with a declaration that, quote, eight hours shall constitute a legal day's labor from and after May 1st, 1886, end quote. Both the FOTLU and the Knights of Labor would support strikes and demonstrations to achieve it. When May 1st finally arrived, 40,000 workers went on strike in Chicago, and over 300,000 workers across the United States walked off their jobs. For two days, rallies and demonstrations ensued without violence, but on May 3rd, police attacked and killed picketing workers at the McCormick Reaper Works plant. Labor leaders called for a public meeting to protest the deaths set for the evening of May 4th in Haymarket Square. The events that ensued at Haymarket are fuzzy. 
A chaotic scene of protesters and police became the site of a bomb explosion whose source has never been proven, followed by gunshots. When things were quiet, the scene left nearly a dozen dead. The exact numbers are disputed, but the Illinois Labor History Society states that seven policemen and four workers were killed. Despite having no hard evidence on their side, the police placed blame on eight people they believed to be anarchists. Albert Parsons, August Spees, Samuel Fielden, Oscar Nieb, Michael Schwab, George Engel, Adolf Fisher, and Louis Ling. These charges were rooted in not only anti-anarchist and anti-communist sentiment of the time, but also deeply entrenched xenophobia. Much of the labor force was made up of immigrants, and so anarchists, communists, immigrants, and workers became easy scapegoats. Six of the eight defendants were immigrants, and seven of the eight men were found guilty and sentenced to death. Two of the men's sentences were changed to life in prison. One was exonerated, and five remained uh, to be hanged. Louis Ling was found dead in his jail cell before the execution. And so, on November 11th, 1887, Adolf Fisher, George Engel, Albert Parsons, and August Spees were hanged. May Day celebrations are meant to honor the lives of these people and the movements from which they emerged. Now, I wanted to just sort of like build on that really quick and center us in the words of one of the Haymarket martyrs themselves, Albert Parsons. And then I want to get Mance's thoughts on this. But uh, Albert Parsons um, famously wrote from his cell on death row before he was hanged by the state, quote, And now to all I say, falter not, lay bare the inequities of capitalism, expose the slavery of law, proclaim the tyranny of government, denounce the greed, cruelty, abominations of the privileged class who riot and revel on the labor of their wage slaves, end quote. So that's really the, the, the fulcrum of this sacred holiday, right? This is, this is the furnace through which the fires of May Day uh, were kindled and they continue to burn today in the year of our Lord 2023. And so again, we're going to talk about how and why we have to keep that fire burning. But uh, to start us off, Mansa, I was curious, you know, we've gotten to work together now for a year. It's been an honor and privilege to do so. Definitely. You obviously, as you've said on the show, um, you know, you were locked up for 48 years, um, many of which were spent with our departed brother and comrade, Eddie Conway. I was wondering if we could start by, um, if I could start by just asking you, like, what, if anything, May Day meant to you guys on the inside? And, and as you was reading this information, I'm thinking about how the attitude, the, the reason behind May Day was the inhuman working conditions and the long hours. So you can juxtapose that or you can place that on any prison. Mm. Inhuman working conditions and long hours. But in terms of your question, May Day in, in most prisons started out much like what we know is a May Day in the United States, the festivities. So you see a lot of that in prison. You, you know, it's an opportunity because uh, most people be off from work. Mm -hmm. So the institution is more prone to allow you to have like organized sports activity, competitive sports activity. But for us, uh, any the revolutionary collective that I was a part of, and most revolutionary collectives in prison, they take it as an opportunity to educate the population about the work conditions that we're undergoing and in the terms of industry. If you work in the industry, poor working conditions, long hours, no pay, or little of no pay. So we try to educate the population about the need to understand that we need to organize this industry that we're making astronomical money for and not get no return on. And that might come in the fashion of telling them to try to get them, organize them to strike, organize them to unionize, organize them to, like, slow down, mm -hmm. or in an anarchist fashion, sabotage. Mm -hmm. So uh, any of those things was on the table. 
a lot of times what we were doing in, in the, the Revolutionary Collective I was a part of in the pen, we would take this opportunity to like try to get the prisoners not to go in the kitchen, to focus on better living conditions, saying, well, you know, okay, this is an opportunity to get to educate the population. Say, look, don't go in the kitchen to eat because the food is bad, the way we live in is bad. This is an opportunity for us to show solidarity around getting better living conditions. So yeah, it it was it had multifaceted aspects to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's really, really interesting to to hear you say that. Um because yeah, like you said, I think um there is sort of a lost cultural memory in the United States, especially about what the significance of May Day mm-hmm. is. It's not to say we've all forgotten it. But Labor Day, you know, in the fall has definitely kind of become this sort of sanitized labor holiday um, where we can sort of celebrate how far we've come. Right. And that's kind of the really the function of Labor Day, as it's known in North America. Uh, And this again, you know, there's a whole history behind this. This was very explicitly Mm. the goal of the people who pushed for moving Labor's holiday from May 1st uh, to, to the current Labor Day. Um, it was more of uh, honoring kind of the sacrifices workers had made in the past to get us to this sort of realized utopia of the modern United States, mm-hmm. right? There was this very American exceptionalist sort of uh, uh, conceit sort of underwriting everything. Um, and that in the 20th century, in the 21st century and beyond, um, we were really enjoying the fruits of all those past struggles. Mm-hmm. But the implication is that the struggle doesn't, isn't still going. Right. Right. Whereas that's what I think one of the fundamental differences between May Day and Labor Day is that May Day both honors um, the sacrifices, including um, the martyrdom, the, 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 the murder, the mm-hmm. lost life right. of all workers who toiled under slavery in the fields and factories. Um, people who have spent their whole lives and have even lost their lives in coal mines, right, mm-hmm. in industrial manufacturing, so on and so forth. And 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 that struggle goes back to the beginning of time, really. I mean, you and I were talking about this, that um, one of the my favorite quotes that's ever been said on my show, Working People, was when I was interviewing the great labor organizer Cooper Carraway. A couple years back and Cooper said something to me that really stuck with me he said that you know the labor movement in this country didn't just begin when the first group of workers sat down and called themselves like the amalgamated bricklayers Mm -hmm. you know Um, the labor movement goes much farther back than that he said to me from the first time one human being had to serve another to survive the labor movement was born And so I think that, like, understanding that that's, like, continual, eternal struggle over that system of domination, the struggle for dignity, while, you know, we are all, the vast, vast majority of us, put in that position of serving serving others to survive, May Day honors that legacy and remembers and reminds all of us that we are very much carrying that legacy on Mm -hmm. today and I don't, I don't know, if you watch the real news, that couldn't be more yeah, apparent, right? right? You know, because we're talking about people still fighting against um, the prison industrial complex, mm-hmm. the police state, at the same time that we're fighting against um, exploitation in workplaces across the board. It doesn't have to be, you know, international behemoths like Amazon, though it includes them too. Mm-hmm. But also, I mean, teachers uh, right. who are being told to teach 35 to 40 students when they should be teaching half that, Uh, nurses and and hospital workers who are having more, um, you know, patients piled on them than they can manage, railroad workers Mm -hmm. like the ones that we've talked to here who are having their staff cut left and right year after year and being told to do more with less. Same goes for workers in the fast food industry, um, the sex industry, so on and so forth. And that, like, you start to see some real kind of eye popping parallels to between now and that period around the Haymarket affair. Mm-hmm. Because in 18, you know, in the in the two years leading up to to Haymarket, 
um, you know, in, in eight, was it 1884 uh, to 1886, um, you saw a lot of strikes in this country, more so than you had seen in the previous few years. Right. You saw this kind of labor strife. You saw a political establishment trying to kind of figure out what to do about this labor unrest mm -hmm. and and using the state as and and prisons and the police as like one mechanism to sort of like repress that movement and you see the same shit happening yeah, today right, exactly <laughs> and i mean like i i wanted to sort of like build on that um and and sort of talk about um you know because I want people to understand that it's not just that we're saying that we need to fight the prison industrial complex and labor exploitation at the same time. We need to understand that they are fundamentally working in tandem. Mm -hmm. And so those fights need to necessarily be doing the same. So like in your mind, you know, let's tease out how the prison industrial complex like serves a vital function for the exploitative system of capitalism. All right, and, and you made a good observation because uh, when we think about May 1st and then we look at May 1st being giving birth to uh, this concept that we know now is solidarity and it went from to international Mm. And we we know the United States was had was opposed that primarily because they didn't want to give an international characteristic to nothing comments. But in terms of what you just outlined, when you look at the prison industrial complex and the Thirteenth Amendment, Thirteenth Amendment automatically sets up a labor pool, free labor, because it says that involuntary say you slavery don't exist except for if you've been duly convicted of a crime. So therefore, automatic your rights as a human being cease to exist. Most, more importantly, the relationship between you and your work cease to exist. So in the prison industrial complex, because you got free labor, give you an example, in the federal government, they got what they call unicorn, federal prisons, they got what they call unicorn. And Congress passed a bill to say that all federal contracts, labor contracts, prisons get first dibs on them. So now that means automatically that if you are if you a company and you want to produce uniforms for the military, you want you might put a machine shop together and you might want to produce some of the machinery that's going to be used in helicopters or places within the federal government. You don't you can't you can't bid on and you can't compete because they if the federal government if federal bureau of prison has the late has. The want, the want to get them or the need to get them or just want them, they got first dibs on. So now you take, the, that mean that the labor movement, AFL, CIO, they can't compete with that because the federal government always say that, no, you you know you can't bid on this. You don't have no right to this. And that means that workers in in society can't have don't have an opportunity to get this. And more importantly, the people that's doing the work is doing it for, 60 cent a day, 90 cent a day or less. And you and they don't have you don't have no right to unionize. You don't have no right to uh, fair working conditions. You can work basically the same thing you said out early. You can work long hours for less pay. Mm -hmm. So it's a direct correlation between uh the labor movement and and prison and the prison industrial complex. So much so that prison has tried to unionize and Jackson, Michigan, prisons tried to unionize. In North Carolina, prisons tried to unionize. And in that case, went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court basically said that under the 13th Amendment, you don't have no right. So if you don't have no right, then you don't have the right to, like, unionize. It's almost like the Dred Scott decision saying, well, like, you, the reason why you can't sue or the reason why you, because you're not considered human being, you consider property. So in the, in the prison, that's kind of, you don't have no right to unionize because you're not considered a, 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 a person that's relative to be in a union. Mm -hmm. You're considered chattel. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole thing with the prison. That's what complex. It's very important that the labor movement understand it because if you don't agree with uh, what a person is locked up for, you have to accept this reality that 
the industry that got control over them is going to take a job from you and can take it from you because they got endless cheap labor and they don't have to pay them the same thing, Medicaid, Medicare. They don't have to take no money out for their taxes in terms of for them. They don't have to say they, they being taxed vicariously, but they don't have to put no money aside for their quarters. So they ain't got to worry about Social Security. A person been locked up 48 years like myself. Mm -hmm. I ain't got no, it take me 100 years to get my quarter. I've been out at the rate I got to work. Mm -hmm. So this this is this is the uh, the problem that's associated with when we think about May Day and and we should and we in this country should not say Labor Day. That should be like we should always say May Day. And the reason why we should say May Day it's the same way as you were saying as we were saying in this country, July the fourth. It's got the same implication as July the fourth. Mm. If, if July the fourth is considered Independence Day for the United States, then May Day is considered the day that people decided to stand up for their rights and their humanity and and get to understand the, the means of production that they are control mm -hmm. and that means of production is not control over them. Oh yeah, I love the way you put that. And and I think like you really teased out right. Uh, two really important pillars, right, that that hold up this sort of mutually beneficial system of capitalist exploitation mm -hmm. and the prison industrial complex, right? So both, as we said, kind of serve intimate functions that help the other. Right. And so when it comes to building up this massive prison industrial complex, as we have in the United States, we imprison more, uh, a greater percentage of our mm -hmm. population than any other country That's in the right. world. We got over 2 million people uh, locked away as we speak. You yourself, as you said, you were locked up for 48 years. Um, and in that time did a lot of free or near free labor um, without any of the actual basic human rights that other workers have or should have in this country. And so like even just there we see, like I said, these kind of two essential functions that the prison industrial complex serves for the benefit of capitalism. One, um, prisoners themselves, you know, people who are incarcerated provide uh, not necessarily willingly, right? But mm -hmm. like you're forced to provide in many cases, um, exceedingly cheap, basically slave labor for uh, not just like federal contractors or the federal government itself, but also a lot of private industry. That's right. Right? I mean, companies like Whole Foods have been using mm -hmm. prison labor. Like, I trust me, dear rattling the bars, viewers and listeners, like, you will be shocked to learn how many corporations in the U.S. and outside use and exploit prison labor in the mm -hmm. United States to help their bottom line. And so, like you said, while people who aren't incarcerated and members of the working class are kind of always pointing their fingers at each other and saying, oh, immigrants are stealing our yeah, exactly. jobs. Undocumented workers exactly. are stealing our jobs. Non-union workers are stealing exactly. our jobs. And it's just like, as we always say at The Real News, other workers are not your fucking enemy. That's right. it's, it's the capitalists who are taking your job and shipping it uh, overseas yeah. where they can exploit, you know, workers in East Asia or South America or Africa. And they're not going to pay them better. They're going to pay them less and they're going to pocket the difference. They're doing the same thing with prisons. And so you have like this permanent source of cheap near free labor that can continually suppress wages um, outside of the prisons. Mm -hmm. So that's one crucial that's function right. that the prisons serve. Now, the other is that uh, as as Marx and, and and others wrote about, you know, so doggedly, is that when you live in a capitalist society that is so unkind to the plight of poor and working people, it creates this sort of cruel incentive structure where working people are compelled um, by hunger, they're compelled by the need to, you know, provide housing for themselves mm -hmm. in a society that doesn't consider housing a human right. People have to buy groceries and, and feed themselves and their families uh, in a society that does not um, think that it has to provide those things for other people. 
Um, like there's so many like ways that under capitalism, we are kind of pushed into low wage work because right. we have to survive. That's right. But on top of that, um, we also live in a society that criminalizes poverty. Yeah. And so if you, you know, we're seeing it right now from Eric Adams in New York to the, the, you know, batshit stuff going on in California and San Francisco, like people are calling for, you know, mass imprisonment of, of unhoused people. Mm -hmm. Um, it, and like, that's our solution to like, so the people who can't make it under capitalism, the answer is shuttle them into prisons. And so in both cases, the prison industrial complex serves this sort of essential function for the needs of capital. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the arms of the cabinets. It's, and George Jackson, and he made the observation about the criminal injustice system, how it is, in fact, the, uh, the institution that is representative of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And to, to resonate your point, because you find that, and this is for the workers, this is for workers in, like Mark said, workers of the world unite. Well, unite around this idea. Mm -hmm. Unite around the idea that you have an institution that's primarily designed to exploit people, cheap labor, and got endless resources when it comes to that around the world. So you, this institution, you can't compete with. If you in India, you can't compete with the prison because you can do what you're doing in India for a penny in the, in the institution, they doing for nothing. Mm -hmm. So that way they don't need you to pick the rice. They don't need you to sow the cloth. They can take in, the person they locked up and can make them do it for nothing and they don't have the right to resist. It's the same thing in the United States. In the United States, as you, as you made that observation, in the United States, a corporation can say, okay, well, we're build, we got, um, we're building auto parts, machine parts, uh, and the unions say, we want more money in this industry, in this part of the industry. They can say, okay, it's cheaper for us to take all this machinery and put it in a prison mm. and then let the prisoners do the same thing that you was asking and we don't have to do this. We don't have to give you 401k ain't involved, medical ain't involved, wage or uh, increments ain't involved because we can get, we can put this machinery in there in the prison and won't have no problem. Case in point, when I was in prison, I was, I was pressing tags. Now, at one point in time in the United States of America, that was an industry in America. Mm -hmm. But that industry is now in the prison. Uh, metal shops uh, in, the, in Merlin, all the furniture that's being made for the state, uh, colleges, st state government, local government, all that is being made in the industry in one of the institutions, where before it was being made somebody was contracting with the state to get that. Mm -hmm. So to resonate your point, it's a direct correlation between capitalism and the prison industrial complex, but more importantly, the prison industrial complex is an arm of capitalism. It's, it's, it serves no other purpose than for, for the reason of exploitation and dehumanization of people. And until we, as workers like our parents until people taxpayers realize that you getting you getting exploited all the way around you paying taxes to keep this mammoth thing up with these blood suckers running mm -hmm. you, you 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 also at the at your own expense creating a system where you can't compete you got you can't compete with this industry for a job so now you're gonna find yourself like you say the only way you wind up getting a job in the prison is you go to prison mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and just just since I got you here, and I know we got to wrap up in a second, but um, you know, you were telling me some some pretty wild things about what it was like to be a worker in that environment, pressing tags, like you said. I was wondering for folks uh, who are watching and and listening to this who have never kind of seen what that looks like. What was it like for you and the other folks inside, like doing that work day in day out? And when you and 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 this is this is universal principle in 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 the, in the industry in, in America, all prison, because you you get incentives for the amount of work you produce. You get a base pay. Base pay might be ninety cents a day. Mm. Your incentive might be two dollars a day. Add the two dollars. So now, but to, to get the incentive, you have to do. An astronomical amount of work. For example, we was pressing tag, so it's we had we we had to press what they call a series, might be forty two thousand tags, and 
you want to try to get the 42,000 tags pressed by a certain time so they can be, so you can get an incentive. Mm -hmm. So the time might be within like three weeks. And that means the tags got to be pressed, tags got to be, tags got to be boxed up and sent to the DMV. If you don't, they ain't boxed up and sent to the DMV, you ain't going to get no the incentive. Mm -hmm. So this is the, this is the problem. So we work endless hours. Everybody work got everybody is in rotation. You get an hour break. Everybody in the rotation, and then at the end of at the end of that, you gotta make sure that you you press two thousand tags, you shuffle two thousand tags, you collect two thousand tags, you stack two thousand tags. This is a continuous process. At the end of the day, I know when I used to come back, my my forearms used to be because I had these heavy dyes, my forearms used to be, be sore. And all I wanted to do when I went back is go to bed. Mm -hmm. And this is an endless process in all the shops, in the shops, the wood shop, the uh, clothing shop, the shop that they put in sanitation supplies in. Mm -hmm. All these shops had the same incentive because it's, it's, it's the state use industry, but it's called a Merlin Correction Enterprise, is the, is the corporation that came in and replaced, that's being used to replace any private industry. So this is a, a industry to say it's called Merlin Correction Enterprise, and where they get they they are allowed to uh, produce products for the state cheap, and they make an astronom they make an astronomical money. So yeah, at the end of the day, uh, the labor that we produce is, it go back to what you say. The reason why they the reason why May first came to exist. They say May first, mm -hmm. which was May Day. Say we gonna strike for better wages and better living conditions. This is why this this is why I May first came to existence. Well, we're now suffering from the same thing that was that was existed in May first. They gave birth to May first. Well, it's May first all the time in prison. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's powerfully put. And I, and I guess just sort of building off that, and and we can kind of share our final thoughts on on May Day and and why you know folks should continue to fight that fight that May Day represents um, and fight it for all poor working and oppressed people um, very much including you know people who are incarcerated right? because as we've said um, our struggles are fundamentally intertwined and uh, our enemies are fundamentally mm. one in the same uh, or they are working very closely together right, to exploit and oppress us. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. It's so important to sort of underline for people that, because I, I think like when, especially people on the left talk about the history of May Day and the Haymarket affair um, and the Haymarket martyrs, obviously we focus on the fact that they were, you know, socialist, communist, anarchists. They had like a more left understanding of the system that they were toiling under. Um, but we have to understand, as you said, that like the, the groundswell that brought so many people to Haymarket Square in the first mm -hmm. place, that brought so many people in 1886 to walk off the job, right, was fundamentally the fight for an eight hour day. It was the fight against, you know, uh, like dying on the job because mm. you were working with unsafe machinery that would tear your limbs off. It was trying to keep children out of the factories, right? Like so many of these enduring struggles that we are now, as you said, it, either we're fighting again or we never stop fighting. Like as we speak, there are like Republican ghouls in state houses like in Iowa, Arkansas, mm -hmm, and Ohio, mm -hmm who are rolling, literally rolling back child labor laws yeah. because they don't want to pay adult workers uh, what they deserve and, and like actually, you know, ensure a comfortable, dignified life for their employees. Rather than do that, they're just going to try to expand the labor pool of right, cheap labor. Right. So children, they're going to turn, they're trying to raise the retirement age. And uh, of course, they're going to continue to use prison That's right. labor. And so... I say all that to say that um, the reason that Haymarket became such a flashpoint for so many people is because, uh, you know, the movement grew out of the grassroots of people, working people demanding better. But what the socialists, anarchists and communists sort of politics that were wrapped up in that, I think why they're so important is because they 
provided people with a vision for understanding the nature of that exploitation and what needed to be done about it. Because if you have that sort of mindset, as you often say, like then you understand that like this kind of exploitation that we're fighting in 1886 and now, it's not a bug. Uh, it's a feature That's of, right. exactly. of capitalism. Exactly. So you gotta, you gotta, you have to like upend this system, as you know, Albert Parsons like famously said in that quote that I read at the beginning. Like you have to call this shit out. You have to understand that the system is not going to reform itself. That it is bloodthirsty. That it will drain everything it has, it can, out of you and out of our society. And we're now talking about that same system, like killing the planet that we all depend That's on. That's right. And so, I don't know. I think that um, the urgent, the, the cause is more urgent than ever, but I think the spirit is very much eternal and stretches all the way back to, like Cooper Carraway said, the first time one human had to serve another to survive. As long as that inequality exists, as long as the capacity for exploitation exists and um, the ruthless ruthless destruction of lives and bodies and nature, um, we have more to do. We have more to fight for. And so I hope that on this May Day, we continue mm -hmm. uh, to keep fighting and to remember what it is we're actually fighting for. So I guess with that, those are my thoughts. Do you have any closing thoughts and on I May Day? Close, my, thoughts, my closing thought, I want to uh, also quote somebody that was amongst that cohort, August Spies. He said this, There'll come a time when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangle today. And the voices that's being strangled today is the voices of workers throughout the world. The voices that's being strangled today is the voices of prisoners, the voices of the disenfranchised. And this May Day, we need to reflect on that. And more importantly, we need to reflect on who giving volume to the voiceless. And in this regard, I want to advocate that the real news and rather than the bars is given voice and volume to the voice of the voiceless. And this is why it's so important that we continue to support this mechanism. Without supporting this mechanism, you're not going to get the real news about May Day and International Workers Day. You're going to be celebrating Labor Day and you're going to be celebrating it in a joyous occasion. But unbeknownst to yourself is that you're celebrating the murder and the hanging and the lack of due process of people that only want to stand up for their rights. So instead of celebrating it in regard to being a joyous occasion, you look at it in the context that it was birthed in, a context of equality and humanity. And that's really my final thought. This is the real news. This is Rattling the Bars. Thank you very much for listening, and we hope that you continue to support us because you know what? We're actually the real news. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.